All right, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. We've got Mr. Bob Roth here who I met about, I don't know, two, three months ago, I think. Something like that. Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think I've seen you more than I've seen my wife in the last like three months. So, I mean, it's just been like yeah. a, lot of, you know, a lot of just serendipitous like conversations about, you know, I think I've, I learned something new and completely exciting about you every time I talk to you. I'm like, no way. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, no, I mean, I got super excited about what's happening at Artella. And actually from uh, a colleague at, at Pixar, she was suggesting I reach out to you. Yeah. Um, ever since we've just been hitting it off and trying to figure out the future of Artella and just yeah. talk through lots of big issues. And it's been really fun. <clears throat> yeah. So I met you, yeah, through, through Lindsay, who is the producer on Finding Dory. And just to kind of talk a little bit about your background, which is yeah. super, super extensive. And we posted a link to your IMDB in the webinar kind of send yeah. outs and stuff so people could see that. But you've been, you know, an associate producer on John Carter, and yeah. I think that's where you met Lindsay and Andrew Stanton, right? That's right. And they were great to work with. I, re I think I had about eight years stint working with those two. So between John Carter and Finding Dory. Yeah. That's... So, you know, when you're in the film industry, if you find people you like working with, I mean, my suggestion is stick with them, you know. <laughs> yeah. I actually miss those two, you know. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Yeah. And they, they speak super highly of you, which is how we met. Actually, we met through our tele. So you joined Artella, and then I know you were helping out on one of the projects. That's right. Yeah. I've Pure. been working out, uh, with Chris and Eric on Pure a little bit. And yeah. I don't know how helpful I've been, you know, just because I have a million things going on. But yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I was just like, I looked at their visuals, the the concept art they had, and I was just like, this is cool. And I just wanted to know more, you know, that's oh, how I became so involved. And I just think that um, it's just awesome uh, sort of, a platform for people to bring their projects and for crew yeah. members to, to work on projects, you know? Well, thanks. Uh, that was something that struck me when you, when you reached out through a message on Artella, that's kind of actually how we officially got connected was that, you know, first I'm like, wait a second, wait, who's this guy? Like, and <laughs> so, I, so like I reached out to Lindsay and she was like, Bob's amazing. And I'm, it just was so cool. And it's just so neat. That's actually one of the things that really struck me and why I really wanted you to be able to share with, with our community about raising <clears throat> money. Cause that's kind of where, where you, you spend a lot of time is, is helping people and projects get, get funding was that, you know, you spent a lot of time in Hollywood and, you know, whether you were in Hollywood or New Zealand it, with Peter Jackson or, you know, back in the, the Bay Area with, with Andrew and Lindsay, yeah. but you, you <clears throat> strike me as somebody who doesn't have that Hollywood vibe. Yeah. Like you, you seem very uh, forthcoming and wanting to share. And that, I think yeah. that's really what, what clicked with, with us in our tele community and why I wanted you to kind of give your perspective because I think it has yeah. a unique flavor. How did you stay? Yeah, thanks. You know, I mean, yeah. to be honest with you, I started out down in L.A. I went to UCLA, so I was naturally down there. But I grew up up here. And uh, when I say up here, I mean Northern California and the Bay Area. And so, you know, after a while, you know, I was traveling around working on films. And I have a whole sort of back history where I was really more on the finance side. And uh acting as like a financial controller on projects and overseeing the budget and all the, the money that gets spent on projects. And yeah. for smaller projects, that's probably not a big function, but when you are spending $250 million, it's sort of a <laughs> pretty big role, you know? And uh, yeah. you mentioned Peter Jackson. That was actually one of the highlights of my career going over there and working for him. And uh, they had just all won awards on uh, Lord of the Rings. And so me coming in as an outsider was a little bit uh, tricky. Um, they had said they didn't want any American crew members, but Universal sort of forced me upon Peter. <laughs> luckily, over the course of that show, we were able to sort of make a pretty good relationship. He appreciated what I'd done for him, and they invited me back for The Lovely Bones as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of the industries like that. You work with people. If you can build their trust and work well together, they invite you back. Yeah. So that's that's good to know. I mean, I think yeah. it's the same when you're working in general, right? Like as a, as an artist, uh, for me, projects that that I've been doing on Artella, I keep bringing the same team members onto the next projects. Just because yeah. you build a rapport and you kind of get each other, and you don't even have that to shorthand. Speak. Yeah, like Amir. Something you did last yeah. time. 
Yeah, like Amir is uh, the sound, like the composer that I work with, and I'm just like, I love working with him. I don't even have, I just talk to him once, and then he nails it, and it's yeah. so, it's amazing. And I'm just like, now I understand why Tim Burton <clears throat> always works with Danny Elfman, and Steven Spielberg always works with, you know, they all have like their crew, their core crew, and then they just kind of expand out, and it's like, oh, okay, I see, I kind of see how that works. So again, as as mm-hmm. artists, you know, who uh, all of all of the people that are here are yeah your reputation goes a long way so just making sure you're, you're putting your best efforts forward is always a good good thing yeah cool well let's talk about yeah funding <clears throat> right and so this ah. is a tough topic and i'm not sure i'm an authority but i have been around <laughs> for 24 years sort of near it you know um yeah raising money for your project is really hard and I, i'm sure a lot of you already know that you know um but yeah, it, it's one of the tricky bits. And to me, it was really cemented. Um, I mentioned I was working for Peter Jackson. We were in New Zealand and I was at a party that Peter was putting on and he had some of his friends there. And one of them was the director of Shawshank Redemption. And I was just like, oh my God, I love Shawshank Redemption. I, you know, And so I did my best to casually go over and talk to him. But, and I just was dying to know what he was working on next. And he was basically saying like, I, I'm struggling to get my project financed. And I just thought, wow, like, how can that be true? You know, mm. this guy's like my hero, you know? And so it is the hard part, you know, and you hear about projects in development for 10 years and that's generally about the money, right? Mm-hmm. Someone being willing to jump in and, and spend the money um, to make the movie. So, yeah, I mean, the, another way I look at it is like, there's a lot of people out there who say, it would be awesome to make a movie but there's not the same number of people who want to put their money into it, you know, cause inherently it's a little bit risky. Um, there are a lot of projects that just by the numbers don't get distribution. It probably means that the investment was mostly lost, you know? So I don't say all these things to discourage you, but I just want you to know how hard it is. Mm-hmm. And so that each day you go through this process, you, um, you know, you know, it's hard, it's going to be a struggle. There are going to be setbacks. It's like climbing up the mountain, you know, and it's going to take a long period of time, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I think about it. And rather than discouraging you, I tried to come up with a couple um, lists of things that you could always go back to if you're struggling, you know, in this process. Yeah. Um, So one of the things that when we, when you originally told me about, you know, going out and meeting the, the director of Shawshank Redemption, which I thought was interesting and might be really helpful for, for people here. Yeah. As, as an artist, sa- sales is, is a hard thing. Like it doesn't come natural uh, right. for, for me. And I know a lot of other artists, they, they like to be yeah. creative and put their creativity <clears throat> out there. But then when it comes time to promoting themselves, they kind of go, um, okay. Or yeah. you know, some, some people are just get lucky on Twitter and stuff and they get this huge following because their art's great. Right. But when you're at a party, like something where you have an opportunity to meet someone, I remember you were telling me you looked over there and you saw him and you're like, hell, I'm just going to go over there. No one else is probably talking. Yeah. To him. He probably doesn't know anybody else here. He, and I he thought that was lonely, actually, you know, it was, just, it was actually a small group. We're all on stage after a shoot day, you know, and they just mm-hmm. rolled in the catering and the, the drinks, you know? Yeah. Well, they all I, talk to this guy, you know? Yeah, I thought that was cool. I mean, that might come naturally for you, but there there was a little nugget there for me that that I took away, which was take taking a risk might you know be a good thing. Like we always have to kind of put ourselves yeah. a little bit outside of our comfort <clears throat> zone, whether it's you know reaching out if you're at a conference and you see somebody to just go up and talk to them because they're human as well, right? Yeah, and, and maybe they maybe they're just it's a good conversation and that's all there is. And I think that's a good motivation like i don't think you should go like i'm going to talk to them because they may be able to introduce you to somebody with money yeah Uh, but maybe that happens but if you go in with the intention of just making a connection and you know cool things i I think yeah no i actually think that that's really important there's something that we should probably touch on about getting your film financed or made i feel like you need to be not just talking to the director in the room you need to really be talking to everyone you know Mm. And you're talking your whole network. You need to be broadcasting what you're trying to do. And you never know what little pieces different people might go like, oh, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to so-and-so, you know? And and slowly things start to come together. And I know I've been to meetings recently where I'm like, why am I in this meeting? And then three meetings later, it's like, oh, we're going to work together on something. That's cool, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I 
I think it's cool. And, and I, you know, this is a funding story, but it's related to what you're saying, which is I was talking to this girl at a VR conference and she was telling me about all the things she was doing. But under her breath almost, she turned to me and said, and I've also got a small fund um, that we use to finance independent films. And I was sort of like, whoa, hold on a second. What did you just say? <laughs> and she almost threw it away. I was like, oh, wow, we should definitely keep talking, you know? Yeah. But you just never know sort of where those sources of funding will come yeah. from, you know? And that that's something I know that, that we talked. You've been kind of going to, you know, learning a lot more about VR and where investment's coming in from that. And there is a lot of interest in virtual reality right now. And yeah. you know, whether it's today... <clears throat> you know, VR is going to be huge, but I think people know in the future, it's going to just be part of the way that we live, whether, you know, yeah. just putting contact lenses on that have this AR and VR kind of components to our world. Yeah. Uh, it's very futuristic, but it's not super far away. Maybe it's like five years away where it's like fully integrated, but it's I'm definitely a believer. common. I'm a believer in that medium for sure. You know, yeah. I, I've, I've loved taking some time to go down to some of these conferences and just walk around the floor and see what everyone's got, you know, right. It'll be it, these tables and people will have different products that are different pieces of, of the equation. Um, so yeah, definitely cool. And I went to one of the little seminars that they had and they had a bunch of VCs there talking about, you know, there's a lot of interest. There's whole VC funds that have been put together to invest in VR, you know, so there's huge interest there. I think the one thing that's interesting or, or is a little bit hard is those VCs weren't sitting there going, we want to invest in individual experiences, mm -hmm. which would be the equivalent of like an individual short film or an individual feature film. Mm -hmm. They were more looking for like uh, the new production company that's going to be doing it in the future. You know? right. So that's a little bit tricky. I think if you have your just singular VR project, yeah. you have to get a little bit creative because they don't have like a real clear answer to how you make money on these yet. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like, do you find a sponsor? You know, maybe your, your VR project's all about, you know, some lifestyle, maybe it's about mountain biking, which I love. Um, and uh, you get a, a bike company to, to sponsor it and then it becomes sort of advertising for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But like a little bit more directly, you know, as I walked around the floor of one of them recently, I was talking to someone who had these goggles that were wireless and I thought, well, these are really cool. And as we were talking, I told him what I did. He was like, Oh, well, if you're interested in um, developing content for our platform, let us know. And we have a little fun for that. And I think, Oh, that's an interesting insight. Uh, it was just, pounding the pavement with some of the people who make the hardware because mm -hmm. they want that mm -hmm. content in there. Sort yeah. Of you know. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. It's <clears throat> one of the things that we've been trying to do, you know, in our tele is just make it totally free. And, and at some point we'll, we'll charge for it and we're not super running to do that right now. We're, we're learning with everybody on their yeah. projects and it's an experiment and we're trying to add more new features and make it more r fully robust. And one of the things that we're really encouraging people to do is to see that they can start their own studios on Artella. They could actually participate in that kind of money because, oh. a lot, you know, because they could say, yeah, sure. Yeah. We're, I have my production company. I have my team. Yeah. I have my studio, which is a virtual I studio. I think that, that could even be more attractive to the VCs because if they see, huh, that's interesting. These people don't have to commit to having people on payroll 52 weeks a year. Mm -hmm. They can actually you know, pick and choose and just grab some labor here and there um, and pay by the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's really attractive, you know. Right. I think it's yeah. a little bit the, the studio of the future, right? And then the, the hope is that there's enough work coming in that everybody gets to stay on longer or maybe they jump on new two or three different projects. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, I'm a big supporter of everyone should be paid for their work, you know, mm -hmm. so to be bringing in projects that pay, you know, I think it's really important, you know, mm -hmm. as everyone in the community grows, you know, the, 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 the money should be sort of stronger, you know, and right. there's a possibility for that in the VR space. I, I think that, they're actually, you can you have a chance to save a lot of money by just having everything virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that that's cool. I mean, I, I think, I mean, that's been the center around our conversations lately is bringing in projects and funding yeah. and how do we get, take our talent to the next level, which is, yeah. which is a lot of fun. And I think, you know, to those who are watching, we have, you know, an article that we, we posted on our blog about our tele preferred studios and, and, 
essentially what that means is we're, we're putting people on a list that have created a project in Artella. And then when work comes in that we're bringing in, that we can tap into to those people who have finished projects on Artella because that shows that they understand how to, the network works, how to form Absolutely. a team, how to use the file system, how yeah. to actually produce content and get it done. That, that's huge. So for us, that's kind of the, the bar to be part of that preferred studio setup. And then as these projects come in, we're going to reach out to our community who are in that pool and hopefully that'll, that pool will just keep growing. And so will the projects that come in. But as you said, you know, Bob's pounding the pavement, finding these cool, you know, at conferences, people with funds and independent, you know, um, in the VR, the space is hot right now. So it is something that I think is really exciting for us as, you know, yeah. visual creatives. <clears throat> a lot of the VR stuff right now is so new and there's yeah. not a lot of great content yet, which no. is which is the problem with it right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I have an Oculus and I have um, a gear and I log on once a week to see what's new and there's usually not a lot. Um, and then the good content like really stands out. So if you create something pretty cool, it could really stand out and you could go showcase that piece to go to one of these little conferences and tap into one of these funds. Would you say that could be something that people might be able to do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And what kind of, where are you finding these conferences? I'm sure they're. Yeah. You know, it's so embarrassing. The first one I found, my mom sent me, she was like, Bob, are you going to this conference? And I looked at it. I'm like, <laughs> actually, yeah, I should go to this. <laughs> That's awesome. But, uh, you know, after you go to one, it seems like there's, you start to get the emails about the next one. You know, there's a lot of them actually. Yeah. Uh, there was one down in LA maybe a couple months ago. There was one in Vegas maybe last month. Yeah, uh, I went to one in San Jose, two in San Jose in the last six months. So yeah, um, sorry I don't have the future ones on top, but I think you yeah. can find it. And there's a actually a small community. It's a it's a small group. You see the same people uh, you know, again, you know, and it, it's sort of amazing that you can almost look around the room and go like, "Are we the whole industry?" Yeah, and it was it was sort of cool, you know. No, oh, that's so fun, man. Yeah, that's. That's cool in that, I mean, going to the events and seeing them again is probably helpful because it's reinforcing your, your, your presence in the space, which is yeah. cool. You're meaning you, Bob, but like someone else who wants to attend. Yeah. And these are, they're pretty global events. I, I saw a couple that came in. I'm on Twitter always looking at different oh, yeah. things with the VR tags and short film tags and that just to see what festivals and things are coming in. So that might be something that people can look at just for more of the international breadth of of that type of, um, you know, setup. Yeah, I feel like when I was walking around the floor, because it, it, again, just taking the approach of talk to everyone, mm -hmm. um, it was people from Spain and France and just like all diverse. Oh, there was a whole contingent from Japan. It was amazing, you know. Wow. They're coming all the way here for, to have these conferences. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's kind of bring it back. And now okay. you know, we're talking about film and VR together. Um, yeah. what we can separate it out as we go because yeah. you know. But yeah. what, what are some of the elements that you think can increase someone's odds at getting funding? Yeah, I mean, you definitely need to have a strong pitch package, right? Mm -hmm. So something you can go and show to someone, a financier, right? And for me, it's, it's little things, or not little things. So they're really crucial things like having a great story, you know? And, and, or if you can have it fleshed out in a script, that's fantastic, you know? Um, that's even more proof that it's going to work. If you can sit there and read, oh yeah, it's not just a two minute pitch that got me excited. It's, it's a whole script and it works, you know, um, that, and I was also, also thinking like, you know, if you had the rights to a book or something, you know, a book that's got a built in audience, that's just going to be really helpful, you know, in the, and I know that it would go through, I go through sort of a bit of a list here and tell you some of the things that I think you need in that pitch package. You won't have all of them, but, Mm -hmm. That one is, is really important and something that people can identify with right away. <laughs> and I think it's also important to have sort of like when I was looking at pure on, on Artella, some concept art or something visually that you can present mm -hmm. to financiers so they can start to get on your, your page. They're like, Oh, okay. I see what they're going for. Actually, I read the script and didn't exactly get this, but now that I see the images, that's really awesome. I see the world that's going to be, or maybe you see the characters. Um, uh, and I'm a big fan of storyboarding, right? That's another way I think you could like visually show 
what you're going for, right? Because you're basically just trying to get financiers to understand how cool your project is, right? Mm -hmm. So while I'm guessing that the group here doesn't have the resources to board out their whole films, or like we do at Pixar, and I just really think that's a great way to iterate, you know, and rewrite. But maybe choose a couple of sequences and board those out and cut some dialogue to it and put some music to it so that, you know, that financier can sit down for two minutes and go like, oh, yeah, I, I sort of get it. That's cool. You know, and, and I think this community are all artists. But I think you have to remember some of the financiers aren't going to be as advanced. But unfortunately, they're a gatekeeper. Right. So you need to be able to portray to them what what you're trying to do, you know. And I, I think another big one um, is building a strong team. You know, if you if you have a, a a director that's been proven in some way, that's fantastic. If you don't try to shore up everything else, have a, a proven producer, um, production designer, DP. You know, if you can line up some key people, is really awesome. I mean. Mm -hmm. I went to a pitch this week and I'll tell you a little bit about it later, but like it was a series of pitches and um, this woman had probably like 10 or 15 of her key crew members already lined up and she didn't have financing yet. And I was looking at the list and I knew a few of them and like, Oh yeah, she's got an Academy award for costume design, you know? And Oh, well, that guy used to be the head of post-production for Pixar. And you just start looking around and going like, Hey, this is a pretty solid team, you know? Mm. So that's important. Um, and like, as far as the team goes, if you can attach a cast member, you know, someone that has a built-in audience, you know, or someone that the financing community is going to feel like is bankable, you know, oh, their movies usually make X, you know, okay, well, even if this made less than that, we could feel comfortable about financing up to a certain amount, you know, so mm -hmm. that um, also is important. And, like for me too, and this is something I've been working on recently, um, a lot of times it's great to have like a schedule. Like you, you've worked out your production plan. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's our schedule. We, we need 32 days to shoot this, or maybe it's animated and you're like, no, this is the, the pipeline. This is how it's all gonna work. Um, you know, and another thing I've been working on the last month is uh, sometimes they really want a budget. You know, something, we want to we want to see a budget for this project because we we want to know that we're putting in the amount of money we're putting in actually fits with a sensible production plan you know mm -hmm. and i think about the group here like artella is a great thing to talk about you know it's just like hey we're going to be on artella this is our pipeline you know, that's all built in for us you know we're we're going to use the crew right here um you know i, th I think just the more you sort of know about your plan the better you know, and, and I think that that's going to shine through and give confidence to someone who's investing in the project, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take a look at my list here because I think this is a good list that you can go back to if you are feeling like, oh, why aren't I resonating with financiers, you know. You could always go back and go like, oh, well, I want to do something today to push my project forward. Okay, I'm going to go to the list, you know, and see what I can do. So, um well, let me pause you, pause you there for just a moment yeah. and just interject to the to people watching. Uh, one, we're going to do a replay of this, and with it will come a PDF that has some of these these tips. And also, Bob has put together a bunch of links as well that you guys can tap into, which should be great. So, yeah, I'll just say thanks. Thank you for doing that. No problem. Uh, one, one of the things that you know you mentioned about you have Artella as your your, your pipeline, and you know. Uh, the, you know, having bankable people and it might be kind of hard for, for people to, to get their head wrapped around. Like, I don't know anybody at, at Pixar to get them on my project. And, right. but, you know, I mean, I think some of the things that you tapped into is no, the more, you know, the better. And yeah. one of the things we've been talking about is actually how to, how to teach people how to make good production schedules and budgets. You know, yeah. how do we do that within our tele and how do we bring those oh, skills, skills, yeah. skills forward so that people know, because I mean, you're a master at it. People are tapping into you all over the place to, you know, in the professional yeah. world and even on our tele a little yeah. bit as well. But you're right. You know, you can kind of go, I need a million dollars, you know, and you have no idea. <laughs> you just think that's a lot of money, but you can burn through that really fast. The last thing the investor wants to hear halfway into the project, and they've already feeling like I put in more money than I want to, is that 
well, we think we need more. It's it's not gonna, you know, because a lot of times that'll force you in a situation of of making a bad deal. You know, mm-hmm. maybe you have to go get fi- gap financing from the bank, and they're gonna be the first money out, and maybe you have to pay some exorbitant fees or uh, interest rate. You know, so mm-hmm. ho- hopefully you, you want to be as planned as possible, so things go as planned. And there is something called a bond company. I don't know. If, you guys are familiar with that, but they basically, you can pay a fee and they will come in and guarantee the project gets done for the budget. Of mm. course, that's a bit of a draconian thing for some directors because now you're going to have some finance company in here telling you how you need to finish your movie. Mm-hmm. So that's not a great situation for the filmmaker. So you want to make sure I never have to have that conversation with a bond company because we have a sound plan. Right. And, but you mentioned you mentioned um, there is like a standard um, Hollywood thing well you might get a call from someone who says I need a budget and schedule and we'll pay you X for that and it might be two to four weeks worth of work you know and but they expect out of that a really fleshed out production plan mm-hmm. something that they could share with financiers who know movies mm-hmm. you know and they want to be able to go down it and ask questions. And if they ask a question about three lines and two of them are, uh, uh, I don't know, or there's a problem with the answer, then they start digging deeper and they start going away. Hold on a second. I don't feel good about this. You know? Right. So if it did come to a point where somebody got funding from a bigger you know, place or even a smaller place that asked for a plan, do, what do you suggest people do so that they don't just you know, open up a Google spreadsheet and start? typing yeah. in numbers and, and guessing, but to vet something that's a little more sound, are, are there yeah. places like that me, people can tap into for that? Yeah, for me, I, I start with um, a schedule, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I was just doing one for a feature that I'm trying to raise some money for, right? I did that, and then like last Monday, I met with the director and said, Here, here's the schedule I came up with, totally rough draft, but let's start getting on each other's page, you know? You, you can read it and you tell me what is completely wrong here. And that's fine. This is our process of how do we figure this out? You know, and was this going to be on stage or is this on look, you know, is this on location? So I know this is a little bit of a live action scenario, but um, yeah. So as much as you can get out of their head, what the, their plan is, mm-hmm. then you can go about doing the budget, you know? Right. There, there are production coordinators and producers on Artella, which is great. Um, I wound up, I've just been trying to get better at doing production schedules Yeah. and and I've done a couple now for the last few projects that I've been on. And the last one was pretty close. Like, I think we got pretty darn close and a lot of it's just now like instinct, like, okay, this takes three weeks, this takes 12 weeks, whatever. And, and yeah, I guess you just start to get a sense for it. Maybe it becomes an art, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, and so it, it is like it's a learned thing so even as artists like that's the thing i hate doing like the most because I, it just doesn't come natural for yeah. me but i think <clears throat> if you're going to be directing or if you have a production coordinator or a producer or somebody on your project that can actually map that out and then when you have your weekly team meetings with your crew that you're going over that schedule and you're just checking in with everybody that's how we've been doing it. it's like okay look yeah. it looks like that's coming up at the end of next week are we still on target for that how can we make that happen? Oh, you're yeah. going to be on vacation. Okay, great. Can somebody else come in? And so if you keep things on a track, it also actually keeps the project moving. And again, like if you're raising, you know, some money or you're getting people to back it, the last thing you want to do is to have your project just go away and dissolve. You know, there's a bunch of projects on Kickstarter. Many I've, uh, you know, added money to and, you know, nothing happened to them or maybe they're still going. I don't know. And, and you just want to, you know, you want to help them people along, but you also want to know that it's progressing and there's a real engine behind, behind this thing, even on independent projects, which have little to no budget. You know, I think that's yeah. helpful for the crew as well, just to keep them going. And then I don't think there's anything better said uh, than actually finishing something, you know, yeah. and being able to, to show other people, if you're going to raise some money that you've finished something already and that's kind of why in our preferred studio setup you have to finish at least one project it doesn't have to be an epic yeah 10 12 minute thing it could be a minute long it could be 30 seconds of something where you worked with eight people on it and you you nailed it you know just that sense of what it takes to finish something is giant and i think says a lot especially if you've learned so much too 
having to do every piece of it. You know, I, I feel like for me that I, that was my equivalent of film school was finishing my first feature film as a producer. And mm. along the way, there was so many times it was like, oh, dang, <laughs> you know, and you just learned so much along the way. That's awesome. that, that was a long time ago, but it was really awesome learning experience to just yeah. jump in and work on something. Wow. So that's cool. so, were there any other points that you wanted to yeah, add? There? You know, so as far as just making that pitch package as good as you can, I, and I think I covered pretty much everything that the, there's two things that I miss and it will be on the PDF. But one is if you can get any kind of distribution, I know that sounds like it might be really asking a lot, but that is huge for a distributor, even if it's a couple territories, maybe the story is about Thailand or something. Maybe you might be able to sell that one territory, but um, you know, these are called pre-sales. And so if you can get letters from distributors who are saying they're going to distribute your film, that becomes collateral sometimes, or it helps you get financing. Uh, mm -hmm. down the line. So that was one thing. And the other was just sort of know how your film fits in the market. You know, um, if your genre of film is particularly hot that's great but if it's like oh i'm making a western oh well, no one's making westerns anymore well then have a reason why this time it's different or do you know what i mean so just be able to just think about the market in general and then at the same time when you think about the market it's like i just spent 45 million dollars and this is an outrageous example on my independent film but at sundance where i plan on selling it the biggest uh sale was it for 12 million so it was like okay well that's you're never going to make it do you know what i mean mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. just sort of knowing like on the financial side how, how do i fit you know yeah, yeah my spend versus what people are buying things for you know now what kind of distribution channels are out there i'd love to have people understand a little bit about that. yeah oh well geez that's probably not my my forte but mm -hmm. um you know, obviously the studios are one. There's all these companies out there these days, um, like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon who are jumping in and distributing stuff and streaming. I'm hearing, uh, just happened this week, I, I was talking to a woman who's distributing her film on Vimeo. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. and she's charging $4 to see it, you know? Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. But I think there's a, probably a lot of streams of distribution. I'm not sure I, I am the best one to speak to what, what they all are, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that, that's cool. I mean, I know uh, the guys that created um, um, uh, Borrowed Time. And, it, you know, it's just so cool over at Pixar. They, cool. they made this awesome short film. It was nominated for an Academy Award. You know, we did a webinar with them a while back. And there's a replay if people want to watch it. But one of the things they were very strategic about when they finished their film and released it, because the the Academy Award, of course, it's like this giant pinnacle, but they that was their goal. They wanted to see if they could get it in there and, you know, hopefully to win it. Just the window, I think, is from November to November. So it's not actually January to December. So they released it on like November 1st and then just started hitting the festivals super hard and getting it into festivals. So it got more <clears throat> recognition. And then from that, they were they got all these awards right away. They were accepted into the you know the the long list at that time for the Academy. Eventually, the short list, and then eventually they were one of the you know five projects that were that were nominated. Just a fantastic story to to see. Like their their goal with their distribution was just to get it in the festivals and just get it seen and get their name out there so right. that they could say you know on their resume, hey, those little leafs you know that you see, like we've yeah. got ten leafs awards from <laughs> from all these different festivals that's cachet right i mean like that's something that even if you don't have you know distribution right away from going to those festivals and getting it in there you may get some distribution opportunities or at the very least you're getting some uh, cachet that you can bring with you into the next project like hey we, we got this many awards <laughs> this next project we're going to go for this kind of channel we're going to try to tap into that because you know, as much as everyone's talking about Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, you know, and all the others, Apple's getting into original content as well as YouTube and, you know, all of the Vimeo, everyone's going to be getting into original content. It's just the way to go. So, I mean, maybe it's something, you know, we, we need to figure out how to, to crack that distribution nut. I mean, every, there's a lot of people trying to figure, figure that nut out, but I think, you know, yeah. finding good content and finding channels, channels for it are going to be huge. 
Because the last thing you want to do is create another, you know, try to compete with a YouTube when YouTube already is where everyone's going, but finding a way to get your content seen on a channel like that so that it's, you know, not just at the bottom of the list, you know? And yeah. so I think that those are some of the things that, that, that we should be and are kind of trying to look at how to, how to crack for, for independent filmmakers because that's, that's who we are, right? That's kind of what we're, what we're doing here. Now, what kind of channels are there for, for funding? Like what sources of... Yeah, so on? some of them are obvious, right? And we've talked about some of the studio, all those tech companies that you just talked about. Um, there's also production companies, you know, like there's small production companies that um, are out there that might be looking to invest in films, you know? And so, Richie, I don't uh know uh all of them but you know that's one if, if you hear about small production companies definitely meet with them and tell them what you're working on mm -hmm. there's also investment funds which like like i was alluding to earlier i met that woman at a br conference that had a small investment fund and i think there's probably ones that are bigger as well but that's definitely a cool one to tap into and they're mm -hmm. gonna be a little bit they'll be savvy about the pitch package that we already talked about those items that you know if you have that pretty fleshed out they're really going to appreciate it you know? um high net worth individuals is one um and that sort of leads back to the pitch meeting i went to this week it was sort of cool and i might encourage people on our tele to try something like this they could sort of band together because it was maybe like five or six filmmakers pitching their movies and asking for financing and somehow they had each of those five or six filmmakers was responsible for inviting some investors. Hmm. And so rather than just being like, I'm Joe producer and I have one idea that I want to sell to you, high net worth individual, it became this cool forum where everyone got to pitch and the investors could sort of be like, oh, yeah, I want to I want to invest in this one. And I actually don't know what the results were, like what, what happened with the money, but I thought it was pretty cool. And it's a group that I'm working with and they're trying to start an investment fund. Um, hmm to finance films, but I just thought, wow, this could be replicated around the country, you know, and, yeah. and it was, I think people all came really curious about what these projects were and, and what the needs were and everyone had their sort of pitch package, right? And some were yeah. better than others, right? And that's sort of when I was making this list of things that if you could have them, it really helps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, high net worth individuals is definitely uh, one of the ones I'd put on the list. Yeah, a little list here. Oh, um, I mean, here's the, here's the thing about this, this group, all these different types of financing, the chance is you're going to need a little salad of all these financings, you know, and, mm -hmm. and one of the things I have on my list is rebates. And for me, almost every film I've worked on in the last 15 years has gotten tax incentives, except for Finding Dory. Um, and that's just, unfortunately, that's just uh, how you have to pay for part of your movie these days, you know? And so definitely be looking at tax incentives. There's, um, um, I'm not sure how exactly it would work with people working all around the world, but um, both EP and cast and crew entertainment partners and cast and crew have uh, um, on their website, a lot of information about tax incentives and, and how you might get some money back um, mm -hmm. based on your budget. Um, with that. Oh, here's, okay, here's some obvious ones, right? And these might be ones that everyone here is very familiar with, friends and family. You mm -hmm. know, when you're getting your project off the ground, you're either financing it yourself, you're tapping your parents or your friends, you know? So, and that might be how the first money comes in. You know, this is gonna sound like a lot of money, but maybe you need 50 grand to get a casting director on to find you that first cast member, you know? And that's sort of relatively risky money that, that if you can have that already established and his family member was willing to lend you the money, that could really help your pitch package, you know? Mm -hmm. So it might be that that money comes from friends and family or crowdfunding. Now crowdfunding is not something I've done a lot of, but I was uh, sitting on John Carter with this guy who decided to do it. And he raised 15 grand in like a short period of time and he went out and made a short. And I just thought, wow, good for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's an area I'd love to know more about, but uh, it's definitely one that a lot of people are using these days. And I think the actor from Scrubs is Zach 
Braff, I think mm -hmm. is his name. Mm -hmm. I think he raised like $3 million and financed an independent film all through crowdfunding. I think that's pretty amazing. You, know, you could probably do a whole discussion just around crowdfunding because it might be really appropriate for some of the shorts, you know, that are in the community, you know. Yeah. Well, um, to, to tap into that just yeah. a little bit, um, what I've learned about crowdfunding, we have an article on our blog. If people haven't seen it, I, I highly recommend checking that out. That was with Eric uh, Baker and, and Lauren uh, Wells Baker, uh, who wrote that. And they did a really successful crowdfunding campaign. I think my biggest takeaway from that was that your, your fund, your, your, your campaign is successful before you hit publish. It, it will succeed or fail before you hit that publish button. And essentially what that means is all this legwork that you need to do up front, getting influencers to repost or share or retweet your, your project and lining them up in advance. There's this whole process that they followed. There's a, there's a, um, um, there's a, like a thing where you can get a bunch of people to sign up and then, and then when it launches, it automatically like sends out on social media, a blast. So there's all this work you can do up front because a lot of people, they, they do a Kickstarter campaign or Indiegogo and they publish it and then they think people are just going to give them money. But the thing is, it's a sales project and there's so much legwork that happens up front, but it's worthy legwork if you put in the time and, and investment in. So just, just mm -hmm. note that. And then if you are doing a crowdfunding or a Patreon type of um, crowdfunding situation on Artella, if you're a creator and if you have a project, you can go to your overview page and paste in your, your crowdfunding link and it will put a link on your overview page that says, hey, click here to view our crowdfunding. So it also is showing people on Artella that you are actively raising money and if they like your project, maybe they can give you 10 bucks, you know, 10 bucks from 500 people starts, you know, starts to add up a little bit and then it starts to enable you to, to do the things that you need to do. And then uh, another thing, just in terms of the type of content, I think this might be kind of important that that's, that's marketable and distributable. Um, I was in LA earlier this week just talking about this with some um, fairly large studios that are like, what kind of content, what is, what is interesting? And they said the one-off things are not super interesting to them because, you know, it, it's all going to be short format, right? We're not doing feature-length projects on Artella yet, but uh, we will. But right now, a lot of the content is short because it's independent. People are working on their spare time. This takes a long time to do. But the type of content that is interesting to studios is this uh, repeatable, episodic type content. And so they said, you know, if you're creating a VR short, if it's a one-off thing that has no potential to show that it could be another episode and another episode, then all of a sudden that's not very interesting to them. They're not really interested in it at all, like even if the technology is pushed, pushed well. So when you're thinking about the type of content you're creating, think about how could this be episodic? If it is something that you want to shop around and like, hey, we did one episode. Now we're going to use this as our part of our package, as, as Bob's been talking about, to go get some additional funding. And we've got like 12 more episodes you know, lined up and we've got you know, four of them written and boards on two of them. And, you know, so they can kind of see like, whoa, these, these people are for real. So it does take effort to, to get the money. But I think if you're thinking about it um, in these lines, it may be uh, yields better results. Uh, cool. I had just a few more sort of sources of funding here. Yeah. Right? Bank loans is one. I think it's a little bit uh, unrealistic sometimes for some projects and it's really drying up a bit. I was talking to, I happened to be talking at this event this week to a guy who does pre-sales and he's a producer's rep. And he said, basically, even if you have pre-sales, you, if your director hasn't had like three projects that were successful in a genre, the banks aren't going to lend based on the distribution agreement. So I thought, wow, okay, just bank loans are tough. And I, I've only worked on one project that had a bank loan and they, the, I think the producer had to put up a huge amount of collateral. So it's a source, but I'm not, not sure it's just that realistic, you know, uh, another, um, source of funds, uh, is deferred salaries. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's a little bit like rebates where if you're trying to get your project done, it might be that some key people, including the director, decide to defer their salary. And so they take their salary when the money starts coming in rather than um, up front. And um, I, mean, I guess that leads me a little bit to, to talk about like 
how does the money get shared, you know, after, once it starts coming, hopefully it starts coming in, you know, and it, it's pretty complex, and, but it's something you end up having to define as you bring on uh, investors, right? Because you have to sort of say who's going to get what, and if you bring in more people, then it's sort of like how are they diluting each other, or how, how is this all going to fit together? It's, it's a little bit complicated, um, but basically when, when the money comes in, the investors need to be paid back first, and after that it gets split between possibly the filmmakers and the investors. But you need to define how that's going to be, otherwise it becomes a bit of a mess. Um, I, rather than go into it in too much more detail, I have a link for everyone, and it is a really cool article that I refer to on a regular basis from the Producers Guild website. And I'm just gonna link it up here. Let's see this, see how I do. Bam. <laughs> ah, there it is. Yeah, so that's worth oh, a read. I'll, I'll post it because I think it went just to panelists, so let me. Oh shoot, okay. No problem, boom, there we go. It that's definitely there. worth a read, and it starts to give you a feel for like, oh, I see, you know, how the money gets split. And some of it is very negotiable. So you want to be aware of like what sort of normal and when you're being offered a deal that's like way skewed towards the investor, you can be like, hey, hold on a second. You know what I mean? So this will give you a bit of a, a place to start if you're getting in conversations with financiers, you know. And I think that could be really helpful. Yeah, that's huge. Well, cool. I'm going to pause for a moment and take some questions because I think we're getting to that, that point and I want okay. to make sure to, to give enough time for you guys. Currently, we have four questions in the queue, so I want to make sure to remind you guys who came in a little later. There's a Q&A panel down on the lower part of Zoom. If you click on that, you can submit a question, and we'll be Bob will be happy to, to answer them. So the, the first, first question comes from yeah, your friend Chris from Pure. Hey, Chris. Um, hey, and he says, uh, the VR conversation is interesting. I've been playing with Daydream VR recently, and it's super cool. I'm wondering what you guys see as very marketable content for that platform that a small studio could create. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's a little hard to say. I, I would say something that wows them like, Oh, wow, this was really cool. Something that people are going to be like, you know, this experience I had the other day, it was amazing. And, you know, be telling stories about it. So sorry, I don't have like, specifics but like yeah definitely something that people are going to walk away talking about you know yeah we just finished a project in partnership with sketchfab uh and it, it's totally finished and we're just sitting on it now, which, is, which is a bit of a bummer <laughs> we finished it two weeks ago and it was so so much fun it was a nine-week project and it's very <clears throat> episodic in nature um and you'll guys will find out more about that hopefully in the next few weeks when it does come out uh but but anyway we we Totally, we didn't think about that when we started creating it, but as we started going on into this world of these characters, and you'll find that I'm on another project I'm directing, and all of a, it's just this little short film, but all of a sudden now I have this whole idea for a feature film or a TV show with these characters, just because the more you live in that world with your characters, the more you just start thinking about where yeah. this stuff could go. So I think you know when you're thinking about ideas, it's just being inspired about where it could go is, is helpful. I think that makes it more interesting uh, and, and somewhat episodic in terms of what's, what's appealing to people. Um, you know, I mean, what's appealing in animation right now is to me somewhat unfortunate. It's still very much seen as a kid's uh, medium. My <clears> hope <throat> is that, that that can change. I think there's definitely um, interest in, in VR and like the horror space as well. Um, you know, like getting, uh, you know, comedy, you know, stuff for kids is, is good. Uh, so, I mean, just finding different genres where you find there's a built-in audience that's also interesting to you. You don't want to just create something that you can make money from, right? Because you're going to yeah. work hard on it. You want it to be something you're passionate about. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that uh, I know I was involved with a group recently that was looking at a lot of VR projects. And the one question that kept coming up was like, but why VR? Like how, how mm -hmm. could, why this could be a short film? Like, why is this cooler in VR? And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's worth asking too, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I, you guys are all going to know the name of this, but I think it was called robot repair. Did you guys get that ex the VR experience where you go in and you're responsible for fixing this machine, right? 
and you're trying to do it and you're trying to do it and you keep screwing up and it's not working and finally the machine gets all pissed off at you and just says you're an idiot and i thought that's funny and it, it was because mm. you were trying and it wasn't working and uh, for me that was sort of like that's perfect for the medium because you're you are actually interacting and doing something yeah uh, and then but it was also funny commentary because now the computer is saying oh humans yeah well that that's interesting because there's different types of vr experiences right there's the 360 experience which right. is inherently a lot easier to do right. um, and then there's the fully interactive you know using unity or unreal to kind of code different ai experiences which is probably what that one you were just explaining is um, you know that the 360 one like baobob is a great studio to look at i think that's in penrose as well that are really kind of leading in, in the space. Although the Penro stuff is, I, I think it's a little harder to find. Um, yeah, unless, unless it's hard you have to see, a high end. They won an award at yeah, yeah, they won. They won the big award there, which is great. But Baobab stuff, you can actually just you can get it on like if you have a Gear VR or a yeah. card like Google Cardboard, you can get it on that. And like, <clears throat> wow, it's it's cool. For me, that's the stuff I think that's going to be very right there for our community because it's essentially a little short film that yeah. you can like interact the characters do their thing i don't really think there's any ai in it it just happens and you and you just watch it and it's it, an it, aha oh, cool. moment in the one with the rabbit right right yeah where all of a sudden there's these aliens they want to kill the rabbit and the rabbit steps behind you mm -hmm. and you think now i'm really in the middle of this mm -hmm. to me that was really immersive like oh wow that was it's almost like because you can't think of it as filmmaking or games to me, that was an aha moment to like, oh, wow, that's a device that new VR makers, yeah. rather than calling them filmmakers, can and should use, you know? It's like, yeah. now I'm super engaged. I'm protecting this little rabbit and they've got their guns out, you know? Right, yeah. So that is definitely powerful, you know? Yeah, definitely. There, there yeah, I want to say one more thing about... Um, yeah. Because you mentioned 360 video, and I feel like it gets a bad rap. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think when it comes to narrative, 360 video is not bad. And, and I actually, this is going to sound really crazy. I think you take the 360 and just bring it down to like 200 or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that every experience needs to be this way. But if you want to tell a story, it is really hard to give away the camera to the audience member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so for me, there are probably going to be a bunch of 360 videos that are produced where it fills your field of view and that feels super immersive, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have the ability to, to turn 100% around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people are poo-pooing uh, 360 video right now, and that would be even giving you less. But I think in the future, someone's going to be like, I just want to watch a movie in VR. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, a, it's a chance to like really dial up the three, the uh, 3d settings. Yeah. Have it feel really dimensional, feel your field of view. Yeah. I think, I, like I think it, yeah. it, that, that will come around. I think there's a lot of people in the VR community who are really on the tech side and they want to max out the video yeah. with each project. But at some point filmmakers are going to come in and be like, no, let's, let's, let's tell the story. Let's stay in control of the camera. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's my commentary. No doubt. Yeah, I share the similar. Because I, I worked on a project that we learned that lesson, basically. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's just say here, um, Raphael's got a question here about short films. What are your thoughts about funding short films, which are less appealing to investors? Yeah. Well, it, you know, if you take that list of sources of funding and you know you're going to have to piece it together with maybe a few things. I, I think funding the short films, you're probably in the territory of friends and family and crowdfunding mm -hmm. and maybe even sponsorship, you know, like, and maybe there's people, I actually, I've, I'm helping out on one of the shorts a, a bit on the medium or on the platform, but I'm a little bit new to short films, you know, so I may not be the best one to ask about that, but I think you're probably in that friends and family and crowdfunding world because there's no discussion to have about how this money is going to make money back mm -hmm. unless, unless we can invent that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but 
Yeah, so I think those are probably the funding sources you're looking at, but I'm certainly yeah. happy to be wrong. There might be people on, on the who know more than me about that. Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to, to interject there. One is the story of Wes Ball. Wes Ball is the director of Maze Runner, the, the first, second, and I think he's just finishing up the third one right now. And uh, Wes Ball, he's, a, he's an, um, an animator. He's in like animation and visual effects, and he did a short film called Ruin, which maybe some of you guys have seen. If you haven't, I highly recommend Googling it. This is just a short film he did. It's, it's really beautiful and really well done. That was his calling card, essentially, to, to say, hey, I want to be a filmmaker. From that film, he got picked up to do Maze Runner, which is huge and, and is a giant success story, and it's very rare. But at the same time, you know, he wound up wanting to bring some of you know, the crew that he worked with onto to Maze Runner you know, and, and to, to bring that forward. And I've had an opportunity to, to chat with him a couple of times about, you know, he's just very humble and, and he, he's very much an artist. And it's so cool to, to see that the, the one of our peeps, you know, went out and made it in the world. And I think that that's some, something that you can, can think about um, as well as you're doing this is trying to have something as your calling card because whether or not you're going to go and become the next big director or you're going to create your own studio on Artella and that's, very, very viable. And it's going to be a way, you know, in the next year or two, we're going to start to see more people actually making a living through Artella that have done this and have gone out and are now getting consistent jobs and are, are bidding with the best of them out there in the industry. That's our, our hope. It's always been our hope and goal is that we can create stuff on this platform that will, that will rival the big boys. You know, there's this story about, I forget what it was, the you know, the, the fastest mile ever ran, like it, it just forever, people couldn't, couldn't, um, they weren't beating this time. And then finally somebody beat the, the one minute mile or whatever it was. And then it was, um, after that, like that same year, like nine other people beat that record. So sometimes it's just a matter of, of knowing that the bar is there, but going like, screw that bar, man, I'm going to blow past it. And, and being the one that shows that it can be done. Um, I, I think about people like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and Steve Jobs who have achieved great things. And if you step back, you go, these are just humans like us, right? They just had a bigger vision and they, they went for it. So I want to encourage you guys who are sitting at home working on this stuff to know that, that you guys are, are setting the future of how this stuff is going to be done. Mm. You inspired me too. <laughs> I just, I just believe it so much. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think, I think that's really true. I think shorts are really great tool if you're getting into the industry. And yeah. It, it is, like you say, a calling card. It just, it makes the financing a little harder because a financier is going to be like, oh, okay, so I'm paying for your calling card. Right. And yeah. I don't mean to be harsh, yeah. but, you know, it's a little bit like, oh, that's why friends and family and crowdfunding is more what you use in this instance. Do yeah, you know? totally. And, and I, I care agree about you. Yeah. They want to help you succeed. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Definitely. Rather than a dog eat dog financiers, you know. So. Yeah. Well, let's see here. Uh, Raphael, again. Well, here, let me take someone else first. Federico asks, uh, I like the idea to do one shot or a few seconds to understand how better or how long it will take uh, the project to get finished. But as that's not enough. Uh, let's see. The feeling of achievement, achieving the goals at the beginning of the project feels to me different until the end of it. Do you know how to improve this way of planning? Okay, so um, you make some assumptions with your schedule and how long shots are and stuff. And doing one probably doesn't prove the, the assumption. I, I agree with that. So you mm -hmm. might have a test that's a test sequence or a test, you know, a minute or something. Or, yeah. you know, some length of time where you can go like, okay, that's my proof of concept the schedule works or actually, Oh no, we're in trouble. We, we need to adjust everything. Um, like, you know, on finding door, for example, Andrew Stanton's shots ran particularly long. And then you, if you learn that about someone, then you sort of adjust everything mm -hmm. you know, Yeah. in your schedule and your plan. So I don't okay. know if that helps. Cool. Let's see. Wayne added here, Roger Bannister, the four minute mile. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fast yeah that's good stuff man um and then let's see here um one of the things you mentioned about grants now that uh, killer is a project i think we're featuring it right now on the carousel on the projects page 
Um, I've been talking to the creator a bunch about that. They just did a pitch video. They did a blog uh, interview as well. When I was chatting with her, um, they she did get a grant and and had that actually fund them to this point where they've gotten basically everything up on boards, tons of concept art, even some of the models. They've got rigging now, and now they they come to Artella yeah. to kind of start the animation part of it. So, I mean, grants are definitely something to look into and pursue. Yeah. So definitely take that one. That's a good one. I was I was looking into that a little bit recently. And, you know, it was sort of talking about in particular, like a lot of grants in particular might be available to women or minorities. You know, that they, there might be certain grants that focus on, yes, I want to help uh, a female filmmaker. And so that's definitely worth looking at. And then if you're interested in doing like a documentary or something, th there are also foundations that give grants because you are, there's a cause or you're, you're, you're telling a story that this foundation feels like, yes, that story needs to be told. Yeah. I guess it doesn't have to be a documentary. It could be some, uh, you know, uh, animated piece, but um, yeah, that's a good point. I should have mentioned that for sure. Cool. Well, let me, let's see, we're going to take two more, two more questions here and then, then ramp down. The first one is on um, crowdfunding. So we want to start a crowdfunding campaign for our project, but should we wait until we have at least say 30 seconds of finished uh, animation to show the style and quality of the work? Does that make sense? Um, I'll talk a little just briefly about Lenoria. That's a project that raised like 65,000 on crowdfunding, which is great. And Carlos is doing his project through Artella as well. Um, they had a finished piece of animation. They did a lot of concept art, but they didn't finish like 30 seconds. I think they finished like, you know, 15 seconds and that still took them a really long time to do, but it did show people what, what they were going for. So I think as long as you have, you know, just a shot even of what it's going to look like is, is good because doing 30 seconds can take you months can get it take a months to get it exactly where you want and you may want to just show one shot that's rendered in the style and that can be enough you know even on demo reels we talk i get a lot of questions about that like people are like do i need 10 minutes of great animation it's like no actually you just need like one awesome shot 15 seconds of amazing animation can get you a job but typically reels are like a minute long it's the same thing with crowdfunding as long as you hook the people and it's interesting to them i think you can do it with like a good 10 or 15 second piece no problem um, and then, sorry, Bob, I stole the thunder on that one. No, no, let's work together. <laughs> All think. right, cool. And then let's see, uh, Elena asks, okay, I, I have a script for a feature film and it uh, has pitches, sketches, and storyboards. What now are the steps to get it funded? Uh, where did, should I start, follow, and finish the funding thing? Like, help, help me. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Right. <clears throat> like, for me, and, and as I was thinking about this webinar, that was sort of what I was hoping you could go back to this list and be like, okay, now how am I doing? Do I have, how's my team? Oh, you know, I could use help with this fundraising. So I'm going to bring a producer on, you know, so maybe you find someone who's like interested in helping you raise the money for, for the project, you know? But again, I would just go back to these lists every day and be like, you know what? I'm just discouraged because nothing's happening. And I could just go like, well, shoot, um, maybe one thing I could do is, you know, board out a sequence or, you know, or just like go through the list and be like, oh, here's something we could do. Let's, you know, let's move forward and try to get a cast member attached, you know, or just whatever. So I, I think, you know, possibly build out your team with, with people who want to sort of move forward and someone maybe who's um, interested, uh, loves a project and, and is willing to put the legwork in to start reaching out to some of these channels of financing. And I think the director should definitely be involved, you know, but, but if you need help there, you know, maybe you need to build out your team of, of people who are going to help you do that, you know? Yeah. One of the, the roles that has become really critical on our teleprojects has been that social media managers as well. We're trying to get more of them into the platform and getting one of them on your project very, very early on so that you can start to build your audience and get, get it in front of people more on social media channels is, is, is definitely a helper. Um, maybe more so on the independent side, but you know, maybe even on the feature side, if you're just trying to generate, get some eyeballs on it, um, could help out a bunch. Yeah. Now, 
we're going to ramp down because we're a couple, we're a few minutes over. We do have four more questions and I took a screenshot of that and I'm going to see if Bob might be able to be so kind and maybe answer those in text and then we'll, we'll put those in the PDF file um, as well as the, the replay when we send that back out. But I want to thank you all for, for attending and hopefully you got some, some good nuggets and some things to think about. I want to thank you, Bob, for, yeah. for sharing your time and, and knowledge and anything else you want to share before we ramp down? I mean, just sort of like I was saying before, raising money is hard. Mm -hmm. Don't get discouraged. Keep showing up every day. Talk to your network. Tell them what you're up against. And keep going back to the list of like, what can I do to make my pitch better? Mm -hmm. And what are some other fun funding sources that I could be going out to today? And it's just it's like a daily thing. I got to do something today to push my project forward. Oh, man, I love that. Cool. Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you, everybody, for attending. We will chat with you soon. We'll see you on our tele, and this replay will come out within the next few days. So thanks again, and take care, everybody.